Welcome everyone to Down to Earth, Biomass to Biochar and Storing Carbon in Forest Soils, presented by the nonprofit Redwood Forest Foundation and the USAL Redwood Forest Company. I'm Mark Welther, president of the Redwood Forest Foundation. We're very excited by the response to this event with people joining us from all over the country and all over the world. I wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors, including our Redwood sponsor, Stanford Inn by the Sea in Mendocino, as well as our giant fern sponsor, Wilson Biochar Associates, Sonoma Biochar Initiative, Sonoma State University, and the California Conservation Corps. In addition, the work uh, which this event is based upon today was funded in part with California Climate Investment Funding granted by the California Natural Resources Agency Department of Conservation through the North Coast Resource Partnership. Uh, to start off the program, I'd like to give you a brief uh, introduction to the Redwood Forest Foundation, uh, which we affectionately call Ruffy. The Redwood Forest Foundation is a 501c3 benefit, community benefit nonprofit founded in 1997 with the vision of establishing community-based forests throughout the Redwood region that provide both critical uh, habitat for increased biodiversity and also improved regional economic vitality. We were founded according to the three E's of ecology, economy, and equity. What makes the Redwood Forest Foundation unique among forest landowners is first that we focus on landscape scale working forests. We've permanently protected the land from development and subdivision through a conservation easement. We're restoring our watersheds through large scale stream restoration projects. We're also continuing to produce wood products by using innovative and sustainable forestry methods. And at the same time, we're strengthening the communities that depend upon these forests through local governance, local jobs, and keeping the benefits and profits in the local community. Learn more about the Redwood Forest Foundation at our website, www.rffi.org. So now to kick off our presentation, I'm proud to introduce the Chief Forester of the USAL Redwood Forest Company, Linwood Gill. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I'm really excited about today's presentation. We've got some great speakers. Uh, uh, we're gonna start off in a little bit with uh, Raymond Baltar from the Sonoma Ecology uh, Center. And he's gonna give a little overview of, of biochar and also you know, the project and the funding that, yeah, that we over, uh, we've been working on this past few months. Uh, Following Raymond is going to be Kelpie Wilson from Wilson Biochar Associates. Uh, she's going to talk about different ways to make biochar and some of the kilns that she has actually developed and that we use for our project. Uh, following Kelpie will be Karen Youngblood. Karen is the forest conservation specialist here at the USAL Redwood Forest Company and has really been overseeing this project for us. And we really could not have uh, done this project without the dedication that Karen has shown to this project. Uh, following Karen uh, will be uh, Debbie Dumrose. Uh, she's with the Rocky Mountain Research Station in Moscow, Idaho. Uh, she's gonna talk about uh, you know, biochar impacts on soil conditions and different techniques to actually distribute uh, the biochar out into the forest. Following Debbie, uh, Margo Rollins. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Center for Environmental Inquiry at Sonoma State University. Uh, they're one of our partners today and also uh, we'll be doing a hopefully in-person demonstration at the Galbraith Preserve uh, later in the summer, uh, working with fuel reductions, biomass reduction, and also uh, making biochar. So um, following that, you know, Mark will be back uh, and we'll facilitate our Q&A session. So if you have questions you know, during the presentation, um, go ahead and put them in the little uh, Q&A box, uh, which is, you know, down below, and uh, we will get to them uh, after all the other uh, speakers have talked. Um, I want to give one more big thanks, uh, shout out to the California Conservation Corps, or the CCCs, or as, you know, we affectionately call them, the Cs. Uh, th this is just a fantastic group of young adults, and uh, a lot of the work that we did was very labor intensive and we really could not uh, have accomplished this without uh, the help of the, of the seas. So a little background on uh, USAL Forest. 
uh, often refer to it as, as URFC. Uh, it's approximately 50,000 acres in northwestern Mendocino County, which is along the northern California coast. Um, most of the property has been logged two, sometimes three times uh, since the, you know, the late 1880s. Uh, a lot of logging went on in the 40s and 50s, 1940s and 50s. And then significant areas have been harvested uh, between like 1980 and the year 2000. Um, you know, the, because of that past history, you know, we're dealing with a pretty, pretty young uh, forest, very dense, uh, dense understory. I mean, the perfect conditions for those, you know, ladder fuels that, you know, when you have a fire come through, it's going to spread and, and get up into the canopy. Um, also, you know, we have a heavy hardwood component. You know, historically, I like to think these forests probably had somewhere between, you know, five, maybe 30% of tan oak, depending on where on the forest it was located. Uh, you know, today we have stands that are, you know, 50 to 70% in some cases. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, you know, those, those ladder fuels and on the eastern side of our property tends to be a little hotter and drier. So we're, we are very concerned about the uh, fire danger out there. The Redwood Forest Foundation, you know, purchased the property back in 2007. And since that time, we, you know, our focus has been on restoration. Uh, we've done a lot of work on road decommissioning, you know, roads that are down, located down near the fish streams, uh, we've done some large wood installation in, uh, in these creeks to really improve uh, fish habitat. And we've also done some, um, you know, upslope work in the forest to uh, improve the forest condition, both for future uh, timber harvest and also for fire resiliency. So what were we really hoping to address with this project? Well, first probably is, you know, fire danger. Most of the projects that we worked on this year focused on where we're gonna be putting in a, a future shaded fuel break. Um, you know, we have too many trees breaker. I mean, that's just, you know, uh, really increased the fire danger. Uh, the question we have is, you know, what are we gonna do with all the small, you know, unmerchantable size material? Um, secondly, you know, I mentioned the hardwood uh, component, the tan oaks. It's really out of, out of balance with where we want the conifer uh, hardwood component to be. So we wanted to do something to reduce the hardwood component. And then finally, you know, the big issue today is climate change. Um, you know, we want to remove this biomass, but we don't want to necessarily increase, you know, CO2 emissions. Uh, traditionally, you know, we would take this material, uh, pile it, or maybe, uh, you know, chip it. And, you know, you'll hear other people talk later about, you know, why those are not necessarily uh, the best uh, conditions to, uh, you know, get rid of those material <clears throat> materials. Um, but by making biochar, we can actually take that material and turn it into a product that actually, uh, you know, sequester carbon and put it in the soil. Um, you saw Rare Forest, we, we experimented with biochar back in 2014. Uh, the focus then was more on um, you know, the larger size material, you know, tan oak logs somewhere between, you know, eight, eight to 16 inches in diameter at, at, at breast height. Um, we took those logs, uh, we, you know, we chipped them and then uh, ran them through a uh, paralysis uh, process, which we actually, we, we made some really, really high quality uh, biochar but, you know, for us to make that pencil out because of the transportation cost and, you know, not hitting the market exactly right, it, it, didn't, it didn't work as well as we had, had hoped it to. But we, like I said, we've made really, really high quality material. Um, so this project was focusing more on, you know, the smaller diameter material and processing it in the woods right in place and then taking it and distributing it back into the soil. So like I said, we were trying to, you know, reduce those fuels and also uh, sequester, you know, carbon. Um, you know, did we find the answer to our problems? Well, I'm gonna let others uh, talk about our preliminary results. And a lot of it is still ongoing, especially in regard to uh, some of the work we're doing and trying to improve the soil quality. 
Uh, but again, I can say we made good biochar. We definitely removed uh, smaller diameter tan oak and the latter fuels. Uh, and then we have turned that material into uh, a product that is sequestering carbon. And uh, again, uh, Karen Youngblood in particular will talk some about uh, you know, how much carbon we have actually sequestered as part of this project. So, and, and, and the other part of this is we've done this in a way that can be easily replicated by anyone with excess forest fuels or, or biomass they're trying to reduce on their property. This is very low tech uh, and, it, and it works. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions about, you know, you saw Redwood Forest Company or, you know, why we got in, involved with this project, um, go ahead and, you know, put them in the question mark, uh, question spot down below, and we'll get to those, you know, the last 30 minutes of this presentation. So next up, we'll hear from, uh, from Raymond Baltar of the Sonoma Ecology Center. My name is Raymond Baltar, and I'm the Biochar Projects Manager for the Sonoma Ecology Center, uh, as well as the Director of the Sonoma Biochar Initiative. I'm serving as Project Manager for a grant entitled Use of Portable Field Kilns uh, to, make, to Process Biomass and Make Biochar, and we'll be discussing that today. So uh, I'll give a very brief overview of the project, but first I wanna uh, thank the North Coast Resource Partnership for supporting this innovative project uh, with funds allocated by the California Natural Resources Agency and that are part of the California Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. I also wanna thank the County of Humboldt for administering the grant and our partners, the Redwood Forest Foundation, the USAL Redwood Forest Company and the Potter Valley Tribe. Today, we're focusing on work being done in the USAL forest. So I've worked with the Redwood Forest Foundation on a number of biochar related projects over the last four years. And I've been very impressed with their desire to find new, more sustainable solutions for the surplus biomass that's generated by bringing the USAL forest back into a healthy balance. So let me give you a little background on the project. Um, since 2010, the Sonoma Ecology Center has been exploring the use of biochar through a number of field trials and educational activities. And since 2013, we've been providing training on a less polluting technique for conducting agricultural burns that we call the conservation burn. The goal of this work was not to encourage more open burning, but to take an existing practice and make it less polluting. Unfortunately, this slide represents the norm during burn season in many rural communities but there are better ways to conduct open burns. While this technique significantly reduces smoke pollution, it converts a significant amount of the carbon um, contained in the plant material into a beneficial form of carbon we call biochar. The use of the kilns we're discussing today is an improvement on the conservation burn technique. It reduces smoke even further and produces better biochar as well. So biochar, as most of you attending this webinar already know, is a form of recalcitrant carbon with a long list of benefits for uh, when used as a soil amendment, particularly in poor quality and sandy soils. So biochar use in soil also allows for the long-term sequestration of the carbon because it degrades very slowly and it has been named an important part of the natural climate solution strategy for carbon drawdown in the fight against climate change by the IPCC, the Nature Conservancy, and the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, among, among many others. There's also growing interest uh, and financial support for biochar production and use by the US Forest Service, the National Resource Conservation Service, the USDA's Agricultural Research Service, CAL FIRE, and industry leaders such as Microsoft that understand the need to support innovative climate solutions. So this project involves the use of what are termed flame cap kilns uh, to process the surplus biomass generated through sustainable forestry activities, including shaded fuel breaks and selective thinning to make forests healthier. This grant enabled us to put together a mobile biomass processing kit that contained five ring of fire kilns, one that's shown here in the picture, uh, manufactured by Wilson Biochar Associates in Southern Oregon. A trailer to transport them, a 500 gallon water trailer with a pump and multiple hoses, 
a trough-mounted water tank and pump assembly, and various tools and equipment to conduct the burns. Each kiln can process up to 16 cubic yards of forest slash per day. The kit has been used by the USAL Redwood Forest Company in collaboration with a fantastic crew from the California Conservation Corps for the last several months. And details of this part of the project will be presented by Karen Youngblood who's presenting a little later. The kit will then be transported to a project recently acquired by the Potter Valley Tribe near the city of Ukiah and used to process surplus materials generated in their fuels reduction activities. So the biochar produced in the USAL uh, is currently being spread back into forest soils and will be monitored over the life of the grant and hopefully beyond if additional funding can be found. Debbie Page Dumrose, a uh, soil scientist with the US Forest Service, has kindly been consulting on this project and will discuss her work with biochar in a later presentation. So there's uh, no one solution for what to do with the massive amount of surplus biomass being generated in California and elsewhere through fuels reduction, home defensible space, utility line clearing, and urban forestry activities. Some of this material should obviously be left in place for habitat and nutrient retention. Some can be chipped and left in place, and some will simply be burned to ash in traditional burn piles. So these inexpensive, portable, easy to assemble kilns offer an alternative, reduce the smoke and save up to 50% of the carbon contained in the plant material. This grant is enabling us to test the economic feasibility of this in forest production technique. The reality is that burning low, low value biomass in the forest will continue for the foreseeable future, as it is often uneconomical to transport it out of the forest for processing. So these kilns represent a better way to do this burning. Moving into the future where it can be done safely, responsibly and profitably, we're strong advocates for the use of small scale, efficient, low emission pyrolysis facilities that can be set up in appropriate areas. These facilities improve the quality of the biochar produced, reduce further emissions associated with biochar production, and could create job and business opportunities for rural areas often lacking in both. So I would like, now like to introduce Kelpie Wilson of Wilson Biochar Associates. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. And thanks to all the partners in this project for involving me. It was it's definitely been one of the most gratifying um, things I've been able to take part in. And I was asked by Karen actually to maybe cover a little bit of the sort of nuts and bolts of how you make biotar in the world in the woods and and how um, I kind of came to some of the techniques and technologies that that I've been using. So I'm going to just share a little history with you. So um, my background, I've been a consultant in biochar field since 2012, doing all kinds of things, technology assessment of other people's technologies, market analysis, developing the kilns and, workshop and workshops and training. Before that, I worked for four years for the International Biochar Initiative, um, working on project development and communications and biochar standards. And before that, I was worked for 12 years as a forest protection advocate here in Southwest Oregon, uh, the Siskiyou Regional Education Project. And uh, back to my education, I have a bachelor's in science in mechanical engineering from CSU Chico. This is me back in the day um, with my lab partner and our senior uh, project, which won a national prize. And it was an experimental Stirling cycle engine. And, uh, you know, I have this long-standing interest in renewable energy and thermal technology. So when biochar came along, it was kind of a perfect fit. And then um, also, you know, I uh, lived in the woods here in Southwest Oregon for the last 30 years. So um, it's really quite personal to me uh, dealing with um, um, the threat of fires and, um, you know, I love forests. I'm very interested in forests and forest management and forest restoration. So, um, like I said, biochar was a really good fit for my background and skills. And when I first learned about biochar back in, you know, 2007, 2008 or so, and I was thinking about the forests and the need to remove material, I, I sketched out this little um, kind of schematic of how I could envision it happening on the landscape. And uh, actually this has been, uh, I posted it somewhere, it's been picked up and it's on the, you know, you can find it out there on the internet, but it's just a little sketch and you can see, 
here's my Stirling engine generating electricity from a small scale pyrolyzer that's utilizing material that's been taken from the wild and urban interface. And, you know, and I have it um, heating a greenhouse or a school. And I even have the school kids uh, saving their urine <laughs> to inoculate the biochar. And um, then out in the, uh, in the woods where we can't really get the material out, burning it in place, you know, there's your hand pile. But I had this idea, well, what if we could make biochar in place out in the woods? And this was my first idea of, a, of what that would look like. Um, and so then <clears throat> I uh, experimented with some, you know, with some equipment, um, stuff I had lying around, old barrels and so forth, and had a welder friend make this recirculating pipe here. And the way this retort kiln works is you would load it up with with wood and close it and then heat it externally with a fire underneath. Um, and then um, as you heat it, the gases come out of the wood. And this, this is a wet gas, it looks like steam. And this is a, a more rich, energy rich gas that's burning in a flame. And so it ends up heating itself uh, after a certain point and making the char. And it was nice char, but I was only making about half a barrel at a time and it took about four hours and I wanted to do more. And I couldn't really see dragging that thing out in the woods. So here are some burn piles, typical burn piles um, that from a project right next to my house, I'm on an in holding on the National Forest. And I got to see these up close, how they did them and managed them. And you can see that, first of all, you know, it does the job of reducing the fuels. So it's basically a waste disposal process, but it's fairly costly. And um, it has these byproducts like smoke and probably the worst thing is this soil impact. So lots of these little holes in the forest soil wherever there's a burn pile. So how can we do this better? Well, um, Raymond was a part of this journey early on and he helped uh, and Sonoma uh, Biochar Initiative sponsored a workshop that we did up here in my area where we just played with burn piles for a couple of days, brought a bunch of people out and tried different ways of making them and lighting them. And we found that it was pretty, pretty easy to see that if you just light it on top, you can avoid the smoke. And then if you put it out with water, you can save the char. So here I am looking at a project that we had done the year before with some burn piles and you see the char there on the ground. I wanted to see what happened a year later, how it looked and all these things were growing in there. So definitely this uh, does the job of saving the soil and um, putting char back on the landscape. I was pleased with that, but I wanted more. <laughs> so when you make char in a container, basically you do the same burn pile process, but in a container, you retain more of the char because you're excluding some of the oxygen. And the way this flame cap kiln works is that um, they, the air all comes from the top, and the heat radiates down. And once you've charred a certain amount of material, you add more. And as the, as the material moves up in the kiln, um, the air is excluded because the air is not coming from the bottom or the sides. It only comes from the top. And it really works quite well. Uh, here are a few pictures. Uh, this is where the, the, the terminology flame cap comes from. Because all the air is coming from the top, the flame tends to hug the biomass, which is great for heat transfer and for burning the smoke. So it sometimes looks like a, a, just a little cap like that. Other times you see these um, curly flames. So that's an indication of the counter current flow that the, the fuel gases are rising up and the oxidizer, the air is coming down from the top. So you get these curly flames. Here's another picture from a group that I also did a lot of work with, the Umqua Biochar Education Team. Um, they ha uh, had a lot to do with the way a lot of these kilns were developed. And so this is their original ring of fire kiln, um, just made out of roofing steel bolted together. And then the sort of workhorse kiln in the early years here has been the Oregon kiln. We called it that because we really designed it for the Oregon conditions of making biochar in the woods. It's very robust. It's very large though and very heavy and it works quite well, but it's, it's challenging, especially for um, you know, a smaller operation that doesn't have a lot of equipment to move these around. And it makes about a cubic yard of biochar in about four hours. 
So the next step for me was to develop this new improved ring of fire kiln. It's a little bit bigger. It's a lot easier to move because it's in pieces that come apart. So the, the individual pieces don't weigh a lot. And the heat shield uh, improves the efficiency quite a bit. So I can make about one and a half cubic yards in four hours. So that's great. Um, and um, it has other, some other neat features as well. So, uh, you know, I'm not the only one that's been doing this. Uh, people have been doing this all over the world. And, um, and at this stage, there's, there's quite a, a variety of different uh, container types that can be used to make biochar. They, we would call flame cap kilns, and I've sort of categorized them here uh, according to mobility, the feedstock size, how you feed them, and how you quench them. And so basically there's small bin kilns, like the Oregon kiln, there's large bin kilns, like this big box kiln that's been developed in Utah by the Utah Forest Service. And then there's the ring, then what I call panel kilns. So the ring of fire kiln is one of those. So those are sectional kilns that piece together. So we have the technology now, I think, down pretty well. And so the next, next stage is to figure out what is our impact of doing this. And um, that's gonna relate pretty closely to how it's valued and how it's paid for. And so the, one of the amazing things about biochar is it's fairly easy to figure out what your climate impact is because um, you, know, you just weigh the biochar and we can, we can test the biochar and get a good idea of how much recalcitrant carbon is. And that's just the carbon that's gonna stay there for a thousand years and not get uh, returned to the atmosphere. And so, you know, looking at the bulk density of a cubic yard of biochar weighs about 200 pounds, then 10 cubic yards of biochar would weigh 2000 pounds or a ton. And a quick rule of thumb is one ton of biochar is equal to about two and a half tons of sequestered CO2. So just looking at the volume of what you've made, you can make a really good quick estimate of how much carbon you've sequestered. Now, of course, it's a little more complicated than that because you, in order to really know, you have to subtract the, the carbon you emitted to make the biochar. Um, and so I was, that's called life cycle analysis. And I got to be part of this waste to wisdom life cycle assessment of biochar that took place a few years ago. Um, and so I worked on that. And this uh, chart here that I wanna show you just illustrates how that works. And Rufi was a part of that as well. This is the, the gasifier um, that's similar to the, to the unit that was used uh, that Rufi had at, um, there in Piercy. And um, it's a nice machine. Um, it uses a lot of components though. So just comparing, here it's very simple. Here you've got blowers, you've got augers, you've got dryers, and you had to chip the material, um, which is great when you have big material because you do need to chip it to do anything with it. And this is a, a very nice machine, but when you look and this bar shows the gray is the sequestered carbon, the orange is um, basically the emissions during the process and the green, is just represents the biomass that, that took the carbon out of the air. So the black bar then is the net, the balance. And so for instance, over here, a standard burn pile is considered carbon neutral. So the bar is right at zero because the, the tree grew and took carbon out of the air and then it was um, burned and it went back. So we definitely have an advantage of negativity when we have a machine like this. But the simpler, prod, the simpler um, technologies are actually better. Now, this kind of machine is, is what you would want, like in that first diagram I showed you of all of the different, um, the landscape of, of, of biomass. This is the kind of machine you want where you can utilize the heat energy and offset fossil fuels. So just a quick tutorial on life cycle analysis. And um, yes, I am manufacturing and selling these kilns. Uh, get a hold of me if you're interested in having one. And thank you so much for including me and um, uh, letting me be part of this. And uh, now I'd like to introduce to you um, Karen Youngblood, who is the project manager for the um, on-site biochar uh, biochar in place program for the USAL Redwood Forest. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. 
Thank you, Kelpie. That was great. And thank you um, all for joining us on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon. I'm Karen Youngblood, um, the forest conservation specialist for the USAL Redwood Forest Company and the project manager for our biochar in place feasibility project. And I just have to thank Raymond for initiating the idea of trying out these portable kilns in on USAL Forest and Kelpie, of course, for providing the kilns and training and lots of support through the process. And finally, yes, the, the California Conservation Corps crew has been tremendous in helping us get this work done. We've been working for the last three months um, in several different sites with the kilns, uh, thinning, piling, making biochar, uh, spreading it on the soils. And so I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes um, sharing with you the work we did and some of the lessons we learned. Here's a map of showing you saw redwood forest um, and the sites we selected for this project. The sites are shown by these uh, yellow highlighted stars. And our four treatment areas ranged in size from about two to 18 acres. And they were all located within our shaded fuel break and existing fuel break. Um, so we chose these sites because they are in the uh, highest priority areas for fuel reduction. Um, we really wanted to see how effective we could, could uh, be at reducing ladder fuels and protecting our watersheds in the nearby communities. This picture um, is of one of our sites. You can see the very dense uh, tan oak stand um, and the accumulation of uh, fuels on the forest floor. And this is a, another site. This is a 10 acre site um, on the 5100 road. And this site had a significant fuel buildup on the forest floor from previous harvest, uh, harvest work. This is another site that we haven't gotten to yet. We'll probably be getting here uh, in a couple weeks. This is a meadow restoration site, um, also in our shaded fuel break. Um, we selected this site because you can see in this picture the conifer encroachment. Um, these are young conifers surrounding a canyon live oak. And the size of the material is perfect uh, for burning in these portable kilns. And here's another picture of one of our sites. This is where, these are two existing burn piles. They've been here for a few years and they're pushed up against the trees um, and living vegetation and just uh, positioned um, in, in a way that it would be unsafe to burn them as an open burn pile. So, um, we brought heavy equipment out to the site and experimented with using uh, the material in these piles as feedstock for the portable kilns and the heavy equipment um, to load the kilns. In December, we had our thinning crew come out and do the, you know, the first step of, of this process, um, cut the fuel and um, ideally, it would make sense to do the thinning work in the spring and um, follow up with the burning of the biochar in, in the winter. Um, in, in our case, uh, we actually had about maybe two and a half months for the, the material to season before we burned it. And, and it worked, but it would have been better if it could have had a little more time on the slopes. Um, the trees that were cut here were, uh, up to about 10 inch, uh, 10 inches diameter at breast height. And so the bottoms of the trees were too big to burn in the kiln. So those were cut and left on site. And the seas uh, spent a couple weeks pulling all, this, all the tops and uh, the rest of the material down to the landing to pile and burn. It's really helpful to identify your kiln sites before the project so the work crew knows where to pile the feedstock. The seeds made these beautiful piles. Um, they would cut them to length to about five foot length. The kilns that the ring of fire kilns are about six foot in di diameter. So they by stacking them 
right by the kiln and cutting them to length that made the burn day go very efficiently. So once our feedstock was piled, we were ready to make biochar. And on burn days, we would try to have the kilns assembled the day before, um, just so we could arrive first thing in the morning um, and load and get the fires lit. And the next few slides I have will uh, show you the process of a burn day. This is a picture of uh, the ring of fire kiln flat on the landing. You can see the panels, they're all the same size. Um, and the panel that the two core members are carrying is actually one of the uh, panels to the heat shield. Um, so the first step is to assemble the kiln. And here we have a core member uh, putting the wing nuts on the bolts to hold the heat shield on. And you can see down here um, that it's really important that you have a good seal um, on the bottom of the kiln so oxygen is not getting in. So we'll just use use our McLeods to dig up the dirt and you know make a nice seal at the bottom. But you don't want to seal off the air getting through between the heat shield and the inner ring. And here's a picture of the Oregon kiln. As Kelpie mentioned, they're really heavy. Uh, with a work crew like the C's, it took four people to comfortably carry it and they would actually move it a considerable distance. Um, it also fits in the back of a pickup truck. Um, and the ring of fire kilns do as well. We we would, after a burn day, we would load up several kiln, kilns, the parts of several kilns in the back of a pickup truck and move it to the next site. For this project, we used four ring of fire kilns and two of the Oregon kilns. So once our kilns are um, loaded, then it's time to light the fire. And lighting the fire can be kind of challenging, um, especially because this work is done in the winter. So the wood is often wet. Um, even that, you know, we could be working in the rain as, as we did many times. Um, when we first started this project, uh, the first few burn days, it, it took us about an hour to get the fire lit using a propane torch. Um, and over the course of the time doing this, we got you know more experienced in building the fire well, and really most importantly is having the driest material, dry small material on the top of the kiln for lighting. And we got the light time down to um, 15 minutes. Once there's a nice uh, flame cap on, on the kiln and the wood burns down uh, for a half hour or so and, and coals start to develop, then we just start adding wood and keep the kiln loaded and the flame going for, for hours. Um, and we were burning for about six hours every day that we burned. Um, and during this time, after a, one or two hours, of um, adding smaller uh, one, two inch diameter pieces of wood, then the, it was so hot that we could start adding the larger pieces, three inch, four inch, and even sometimes five inch um, diameter pieces of wood. Here's a picture of the Oregon kiln with the larger pieces of wood on top. We had um, different configurations of kiln layout in this project. Um, this picture here is showing uh, we here we had three ring of fire kilns lined along, you know, set up along this forest road and one Oregon kiln. And then we parked our 500 gallon uh, water trailer um, in the middle so it could reach all of them with the water hose. We, we learned that it takes about 150 gallons of water to quench the ring of fire kilns and about 100 gallons of water to quench the Oregon kiln. Here we set the kilns up off of the road. This is in a planted unit. And uh, here we relied on a portable water tank and a portable water pump. And we had our, our water, our larger 500 gallon truck parked um, about 300 feet away on a rocked road. So we had 300 feet of fire hose. That was our limitation to how far we could get um, off of the road. 
strategizing the water for this project is has you know where where we put the water, um, filling up the water tanks, getting the water tanks to the site. That's been, that's take, taken quite a bit of time. We would often go out the day before um, and spend half a day getting the water tanks full and, and staged for the burn. So this is a, another site where we set up all our kilns. This is a landing and, and landings are probably the most convenient, um, efficient places to set up multiple kilns. We can have um, all the kilns, all the feedstock, and the water tanks right here in one location. So once the, the fires have been burning for about six hours, then it's time to put the fires out. And you can see here that uh, we're using a fire hose connected to our water tanks or water trailer. And the first step is to cool off that outer ring heat shield so we can take the nuts and bolts off and, and take it off and, and actually disassemble the kiln to access the biochar. And before we completely take apart the inner ring, uh, we, we like to spread out the biochar and get a measurement. And you can see here in this ring of fire kiln on the left, um, we, it's almost full of biochar and the general rule uh, with these ring of fire kilns is about one foot of depth is about one cubic yard of biochar. So in a six hour burn, we were actually getting almost three cubic yards of biochar with, with a little bit of unburned material, but most of the material was burning. Over on the far right, you can see the Oregon kiln full of biochar and the Oregon kiln makes about one cubic yard. So we continue the quenching process to cool off the inner ring and take the nuts and bolts off that so we can separate the panels. And you can see here that even though the biochar in the top half of the kiln has been quenched and cooled off, there's still some hot coals in the bottom. So it's really important to pull those panels off so you can start rake out the char and quench um, and get those those coals cooled off. And once the biochar is completely raked out, we do one more uh, spray down to make sure nothing is hot before we leave for the day. And this site here is a site that had been planted a couple years ago. Um, we wanted to put the biochar on the young seedlings and monitor the growth rate and vitality. So being able to burn right in the unit allowed us to minimize moving both the biomass and the biochar. So here's a summary of our numbers for one month of work on a five acre site with the three panel kilns. And um, this, these numbers are tallying up all the days we worked thinning, piling, charring, and spreading the char on the soil. So you can see this top number, 15 days to do the prep work is quite a bit more than the actual days of, of burning the biomass. So for us, it was taking um, for, for the CCC crew, for the, the manual uh, labor crew, it was taking us about three days of prep work for one day of burning. And in that month of work, we were uh, burning about 133 uh, cubic yards of biomass and making about 43 cubic yards of biochar. And that amounted to about 11 metric tons of carbon dioxide sequestered. So here's a, a picture of our mechanical loading operation. Um, with this experiment, we put together, we made an extra large kiln out of two of the smaller kilns. So we used, uh, we used five panels, not six, but five panels instead of the three panels for the smaller kilns. And this made a kiln that was about 10 feet in diameter. And then we used the mini excavator to load all the wood into the kiln uh, with one person on the ground kind of, you know, helping keep the sticks in the fire and just kind of managing the fire. And here's a, a short video of the excavator in action. And this pile in the front here is showing you the biochar that was made from one day 
with the big kiln. We, we did this for three days. Um, and the slide I showed you earlier of the two uh, burn piles, it, those, that's what we used. We, it took us three days to burn all the feedstock in those burn piles. And you can see over here up on the slope are some really big logs. Those were actually in the burn piles. So the equipment operator pulled those out and set them aside. They were too big to burn in this kiln. The piles had quite a bit of fines and even dirt mixed in with the wood. So having the, the excavator was really helpful to shake out the fines and kind of separate the wood from uh, the material that would have put the fire out. And then you can see here, he's just, he got really good at, at just finessing the bucket to kind of spread the wood evenly across the top. And I would say that, you know, the hardest, the, the most challenging part of using the extra big kiln and the, the excavator was keeping the fire burning evenly across the top. Um, it just, you know, we, it, we had to be really careful with the rate of application of material to not put out the fire and to make sure there, um, you know, that the fire was burning evenly. So here are some numbers that um, are comparing the manual loading to mechanical loading. And, and these are averages, breaking it down to just comparing one day of making biochar. And I would say the biggest difference is the amount of workers you need for manual loading, 12 compared to two or, or maybe three with mechanical loading. Um, with the manual loading, of course, we use more kilns. We use five kilns compared to just one with the mechanical loading. But when you look at the amount of biomass and biochar created, it, it's kind of similar, 77 to 50 and 11 to 7.5 cubic yards of biochar. I think the mechanical loading was perfect for the big burn piles. And there's definitely a place um, where that would be really the right uh, method to use. Um, just as with the manual loading, the sites like the area where the tree that, you know, off the road um, where trees have recently been planted and you can't, you know, have heavy equipment, um, it's perfect for the manual loading. The last step of this process is spreading biochar on the forest soils. To maximize the climate benefit, we kept all the biochar we made on site, and to be efficient, we moved it as short a distance as possible from where it was made. Because the soil benefits from biochar and forest health is still being studied, we're setting up soil plots in all of our treatment areas where we will monitor soil properties over time, looking at soil carbon, soil moisture, and pH. And we'll also monitor the tree seedlings uh, where we've applied biochar. And I just want to make a quick plug for any students out there who might be watching this or any of you who know students who are watching this and are looking for a project, we would love to work with you. So please uh, give, me a, give me a call or email me, karen at refi.org, and uh, maybe we can develop a study. So the C's made it look pretty easy uh, putting the biochar on on the soil, which, you know, it was, this was a big question mark for me, just, you know, how are we going to get this biochar out there on the forest soils? And we used um, five gallon buckets and wheelbarrows. And here they are carrying them up the steep slope uh, that has still has quite a bit of slash. So a lot of tripping hazards. Um, but surprisingly, they were able to get all of the biochar we made um, at this site in five days of burning on um, distributed across two areas that we'll be using for our soil monitoring. And it covered about almost, it, not quite, but almost an acre. So in conclusion, is it feasible to use portable kilns in a forestry setting? I would say yes. Are we making an impact? Yes, if we are strategic about site selection. Just as with any restoration project, this work is expensive and labor intensive. So we need to very carefully plan where we can be most efficient and make the biggest impact reducing hazardous fuels and restoring soils. 
So I do think using portable kilns and returning biochar to forest soils can complement um, our other watershed restoration work we do. Also, this has been an, a great educational opportunity. We've trained probably 30, maybe even 40 young adults from California Conservation Corps on how to make biochar and think about climate solutions. Is this scalable for forestry management? Um, I think with that, we, we still have to think about um, what type of kilns we're using at each site, how we're distributing the soil, how can we distribute the soil more, most efficiently or the biochar to the soil most efficiently, and where is the biochar most beneficial? Is it the young trees, is it, or is it somewhere else? Um, we have a big need for fuel reduction and soil restoration and a need to think of climate solutions. So I think it's important that we figure out how to make this work and, and how it can be sustainably scaled up. So thanks again for joining us today. And now I would like to introduce our next, speak, next speaker, uh, Debbie Page Dumrose from, from the Rocky Mountain Research Station. Thanks, Karen. And um, I want to thank all of you for joining in. Um, and I also want to thank the organizers for um, bringing this meeting together um, and for the presenters who came before me because they've done an excellent job of setting up my presentation about soil health and thinking about some long-term impacts of um, putting biochar on the soil. So what is soil health? You know, there are a lot of attributes that contribute to healthy soil and, um, you know, the um, there are 42 attributes have been identified. It includes carbon content, pH, water holding capacity, infiltration, the ratio of fungi to bacteria, and the fluxes that happen between the chemical, physical, and biological properties. But there's one um, attribute that's key to almost every other attribute, and that's the organic matter content of the soil. This single property is one that is easy to measure and that we can contribute to with biochar. So we're concerned about healthy soils, um, mostly because they help us contribute to clean water and uh, better water yield. They increase yields of crops um, and maybe rangeland plants. They reduce wind and water erosion. Healthy soils make forest range or agricultural soils more resilient to climate change or other changes. And in addition to creating ecosystem resilience, they can provide jobs like that have been discussed today. Um, Karen and Kelpie both pointed out how you can put a lot of people to work in the woods um, doing restoration work with um, biochar um, opportunities. So in general, the critical threshold for soil organic matter levels is around 2%, but that's mostly for agricultural soils and it certainly varies a lot in forest and rangeland soils and forest soils compared to agricultural soils. But most important to know is I think that there's nearly two thirds of the soils that lack sufficient organic matter to carry out those functions, those attributes of soil health that we talked about earlier. In particular, I think water holding capacity and infiltration and reducing erosion are some of the key things that biochar can help with. So how do you add organic matter to the soil? Um, crop residues, cover crops, wood chips, and biosolids are used in a lot of places, particularly on agricultural lands. Um, wood chips and masticated wood are often used on forest, are often used on forest sites. But all of those are usually short-term sources of organic matter inputs. And particularly on agricultural soils, those inputs are probably, um, probably need to be replaced yearly, um, if not more. And, and so, you know, that really makes us think about, well, how can we make a long-term input? And, and biochar is certainly um, a longer-term input. Um, you know, uh, in forest soils, we think that biochar would stick around, uh, you know, for centuries, mostly because we don't usually till the soil, we don't disturb it often. Um, and um, once we have that input in place, it usually migrates into the mineral soil and, and is pretty recalcitrant. And I, I like this graphic that if, you know, if we can figure out a way to increase soil organic matter by 1%, 
we can increase water holding capacity by one to one and a half percent. And, and what's key about that is that more and more places are experiencing those longer term droughts. And so um, having a way to increase water holding capacity within the soil may help plants and um, particularly understory plants grow longer into the growing season without curing and becoming a wildfire risk. So there are a lot of places that we can use um, biochar and several of them are listed here. One of the things that I didn't list is that biochar is also um, appropriate to use in urban settings where the soil is usually really degraded. Um, brown fields are another opportunity to use biochar in urban settings. And so um, particularly in the wildland urban interface where um, overstock stands present a wildfire risk for communities. I think, um, you know, using biochar within the um, communities that are nearby are a really appropriate way to use that biochar that's produced. Um, in addition, I think, um, you know, one of the things that um, is on everybody's mind lately has been pollinator species and how can we um, improve soil so that we have more pollinators, both plants and insects that can move between the forest and agricultural fields to help increase crop yields. And so, you know, how do you apply biochar? Um, one of the, the ways, at, you know, for studies um, and small applications, the five gallon bucket and wheelbarrows are perfect. Um, but if you have a lot of biochar that's produced or um, large areas that you want to put biochar on, the Forest Service made this biochar spreader. Um, it's pulled behind a log forwarder, can go up to 35% slope, um, and you can adjust the rate of spread. You could do the same thing with um, things like uh, a manure spreader or a salt spreader, small lawn fertilizer spreaders, they also work. Um, but I think part of um, our responsibility for putting the biochar out on the site is to also think about, you know, what are the soil conditions that we're trying to amend? Is it really um, the best benefit to put biochar on one soil versus another? Um, and what are our biochar properties? You know, how do we, um, you know, is it, is it the, all of the biochar needs to go on the site or part of it and we could use some uh, someplace else. So I think those are things to also keep in mind as we start, you know, tuning into where and when and how do we put biochar out on the site. And then um, I, I want to share this example with you from the Bitterroot National Forest in Western Montana. Um, you know, we, um, we put biochar out at several different rates. You can see at the bottom, um, some of the key points I, I want to talk about are our control. Um, biochar at 10 tons per acre. Fertilizer was applied at 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, and then there's masticated wood, which um, is labeled as wood chips. So from this graph, you can see that um, two years after application, we were able to keep um, soil moisture higher longer into the growing season. It didn't dry out quite as fast. And even as it did dry out, um, you know, we saw some little bumps in um, more moisture in the biochar plots. This trend continued and even um, there was a wider separation um, of five years out after um, we put the biochar out. But you'll notice that if you look at this tree growth, there's really, I mean, we've detected no change in tree growth on any of the treatments on this site. Um, and this is the same for all of our, we have about a dozen um, forest um, sites around the West and none of them have shown really any change in tree growth production, um, which, you know, we had thought there would, of course, there's more water so the trees will grow better. Eh, we haven't seen that yet, but, you know, there are some things going on though and I want to take you below ground. And this is a graph of some um, aspen wood stakes that we put in the ground under those same treatments. And um, there are a couple of things I want to point out. One is that the lime green plot is the control that the bar is the, the lime green bar is the control. Um, it usually had the lowest um, decay rate. The fertilizer is the yellow bar. And with this the addition of nitrogen, you can see you get a quick bump in decomposition. So the, you know, the microbes are going crazy, um, but this pretty much went away after about two years. And then I want you to look at the dark green bar, which is the masticated wood. Um, it increased decay rate at a slower rate than fertilizer. Um, but you'll also notice that by about the fifth year, fourth or fifth year, um, that rate also declined. It, it, it's not until later when biochar, which is the orange bar, kind of kicks in. Um, you know, it, 
we apply it on top of the forest floor. It's got to work its way through that and then get in the mineral soil. Um, and so it, it takes a long time for um, microbes to start to even be able to see this um, added carbon to the soil. And so, you know, um, first I want to say it's a long-term process. There, um, there's no quick fix for soil problems with biochar, um, at least not in forest or rangeland sites. Um, and, and I also want to say that maybe the best um, a approach is to try and do a combination of these things. You know, get if, if you know, if you're really looking at, um, you know, adding maybe fertilizer isn't the way to go on forest sites, but, you know, it is if you're doing research. Um, but, you know, maybe masticated wood or wood chips on the soil surface are great for building that surface organic matter. They can act as a mulch in the short term and then um, you know, add biochar as well. And as that moves into the soil, then you get that longer term benefit. And so you know, I think there are some also some key places where we need to do some work. Um, we don't really have a very good idea yet of what this application on forest sites does to forest insects or diseases. We think that because we're increasing water in the soil that maybe the trees are healthier and this translates into you know, a change in internal chemistry in the trees don't have the data for that yet. So, you know, you've got to stay tuned. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll be able to report on that in the future. And, and so I want to say, you know, as was pointed out earlier by Linwood, um, you know, we, we used to always burn this no or low value biomass in slash piles and the smoke and particulates um, right now have become untenable. And um, we have to find a better way, right? And so um, we can do that through, um, you know, the low tech methods of building slash piles, um, you know, increasing in technology with kilns. Um, you saw the tiger cat carbonator. The Forest Service is also working on a, a air burner that reduces emissions but still gives you a high value carbon product. Um, and so, you know, there I think there's a lot of different ways that we can make biochar and use it um, in on site or in the watershed or move it to um, some sites that are really degraded, such as mine sites or um, degraded agricultural soils. And all of that would improve ecosystem services that we derive from those sites. And um, I think that's probably the key point to take away from this talk. And so I, again, I wanna say thanks to everyone for um, staying tuned and staying engaged in this. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Marga Rollins. I am program coordinator for the Galbraith Preserve at the University, Sonoma State University Center for Environmental Inquiry. So we're really proud to be a part of and a sponsor of this biochar event. And the reason we got here was we've been working with Refi for almost a year on putting together a program uh, for landowners on how to manage woodlands for wildfire. And part of that was to have been a demonstration of we were, uh, I think, looking at the small kiln on our site, the, uh, the Albert Wildlands Preserve is 3,600 acres located in southern Mendocino County. It's one of the three preserves that are owned and managed by the center at SSU. Uh, when, when COVID hit, we had to close the preserve and postpone the program. And our speakers felt that it was so important to do it on site that we decided to wait until the, the university opened up the preserve. We're hoping that we are able to do that in the either this fall or the spring of 22 on the preserve. Um, meanwhile, uh, as we've pivoted to these virtual events, and like Mark said in the beginning, we've created a larger audience and a larger reach, which is for all of our environmental programs as we seek to create an environmentally ready society, well positioned to address today's daunting challenges and to foster sustainability. So I invite you all to check out our events. We have about 20 each uh, season and you can check us out at cei.sonoma.edu slash calendar. If Mitzi, you could put that in the chat, thank you. Uh, the next topic that might interest this audience is the effect of herbivores on ecosystems. So this, this Friday at 8 a.m. Sorry about the time, but we have to accommodate an international panel and that will be featuring researchers from three biological field stations, one in Black Rock Forest, New York, another from the Skukuyu Research Station in South Africa, and finally one from the Kanza 
Prairie Biological Station at uh, Kansas State University. There will be another one on, on grasslands that's going to be done recently at, in the near future from Pepperwood. But I ask again, if you check us out at cei.sonoma.edu slash calendar, and we'd love to, to hear from you. And we're really very proud to look forward to presenting this demonstration in the public recent soon. And Mark, I guess it's back to you. Thank you, Margo. Um, we, uh, we really appreciate our partnership with Sonoma State University and, and actually all of these presentations today really uh, highlight the power of, of partnerships. And so most of the work that we do requires partners and really we benefit from that and, and appreciate you all. So now, as you know, attendance at today's event was free of charge, but all of Ruffy's programs, including those that you saw today, exist because of grants and also generous contributions from you, our community. So if you liked what you saw today, and if you also value the kind of innovative and sustainable forestry that Ruffy is doing, please take a moment today and make a donation at our website, uh, www.rffi.org. And uh, also stay tuned for Ruffy's annual meeting. It's our favorite picnic of the year when we can have an in-person picnic. Uh, out in the woods. Uh, we didn't have it last year. We're hoping to uh, do it this year and we've tentatively pushed it out to September. Uh, so the hope is that we can have our usual picnic and also have a tour of the USAL forest. So stay tuned for Ruffy's annual meeting. So now let's uh, move on to the Q&A session. Mitzi's been collecting your questions and uh, so we'll just uh, go down the list and uh, See what uh, there we have more questions than we probably have time to answer, so we may have to do some of them offline, but we'll try to get to all of them. First question is from Edward. I'm a legate neighbor of the Usall Redwood Forest, have been working at improving fire safety on my land. Would you uh, would like to know how to produce biochar from my slash piles? Is it just to put out the fire once it is down to embers? Well, no, there's there's more management than that, but essentially you, um, you're you're lighting the pile from the top, letting it burn down, and then putting it out with water at a certain point. Um, and it's sort of more of a an art than a science. Um, and uh, you know, we do offer trainings uh, in that, and uh, perhaps at some point, maybe you could visit uh, Karen and what they're doing over there to kind of watch what they're doing. But there's also a moisture issue. You need to ideally have the material be seasoned well enough. And, and there's some other ways that you manage the pile. But basically, you light it from the top and put it out before all the, uh, you know, while the, uh, most of the carbon is still there. Can I jump in on that one for a minute? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, you know, it's all, like we've said repeatedly, it's all a matter of improving on present practice. So if you're already making slash piles and burning them the way you normally do, yes, go ahead and put it out while it's embers before it burns to ash and you will save some char. Um, and uh, there's also really good potential to make biochar without a kiln using what we call a swamper burn. So that's making a small pile burning it down to coals or close to it, and then add, slowly adding more material, just like you do in the kiln. And you could do a really clean burn that way, um, even without a kiln and accumulate char and put it out with water. So uh, I encourage everybody to experiment, see what works, see what makes the least amount of smoke and the, the most amount of char. Thank you both. Uh, next is a question from Jason. Uh, this is for Kelpie. You mentioned inoculating biochar. I've heard that this is a necessary process for biochar prior to, prior to it being spread in the woods. Is this incorrect? It seems like these projects are just spreading the charcoal in the forest. Well, you know, as, as Raven mentioned in the video, this is biomimicry, what we're doing. So when there's a forest fire, nobody's inoculating the char. Um, and it, so char ends up in the forest soils. And as it sits there and as Debbie Dumrose said, it, it takes a while to get incorporated into the soil profile because it's sitting on top. So it may take years. And during that process, it gets rained on, um, litter fall, falls on it. 
Um, so it does eventually get inoculated. The reason why you really want to inoculate it before you put it in your garden soil, for instance, is char has a big affinity for nitrogen. And if you put a lot, I mean, you could put small amounts of char in any soil with no problem. But if you put a lot in at once, it can uh, have the effect of um, immobilizing the nitrogen temporarily and your, your, you know, your broccoli might not grow as big. So <laughs> that's, that's the main reason for inoculating it before use. But in a forest, I don't think it's a concern. Uh, maybe Debbie has some, something to say about that. No, that's right. All of our sites have just been raw biochar. We haven't inoculated them or let the biochar age. And so, um, yeah, I think that's perfect. But if you were um, putting it on an agricultural soil, I think that's when you'd want to think about, you know, maybe inoculating it so you'd get um, higher productivity soil, you know, something like that. But I would say, you know, if you've got a feedlot, you could put biochar in the feedlot, let it absorb all that manure and urine, and then put it out on the soil and you're ready to go. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, next, a question from Jim. Is there a ratio of raw material to biochar? One photo showed one cubic yard of biochar in four hours. How much raw cut material? What we um, found with the portable kilns on, on our forest is about um, 16 cubic yards of uh, biomass for two cubic yards of biochar. So, well, one to eight, I guess, is, is the ratio approximately. Uh, next, a question from Joan. Uh, this is for Karen. Most of the uh, clearing we do is more brushy chamise than what I see you burning. Is it hard to compress? Uh, will this work in kilns? That's a really good question. And actually, we have a site uh, where we'll be moving to in a couple weeks that will be similar to that, where it's mostly uh, manzanita and, and huckleberry brush. And so I actually, I have the same question. And, and I would like to pass that on to, um, to Kelpie or Raymond or Debbie, who, who may have worked in a situation like that, trying to burn more shrubby material. I find shrubby material works great. You know, it's usually small diameter. Um, I was uh, at a burn last weekend on the, uh, over by Mount Shasta. We were burning mostly manzanita and um, um, ah, what's that other stuff? It's some kind of Ceanothus, I think. And it, it burns really well. We were burning green manzanita, um, which, at least in that environment, the moisture content was only about 25 or 30 percent. So it, it, even the green manzanita burned very well. Um, the other stuff was a little wetter and didn't burn as well. Okay, next a question from Asa. How many person hours of labor does it take to make a cubic yard of biochar considering travel to site, site prep, cutting up fuel, and attending the burn? Is this actually scalable? So Asa, that's a great question. Um, considering it take, you probably want about two people, two to three people per kiln. You have three people there. Um, depending on the situation for us, we had another person uh, setting up all the water. We had another crew doing the thinning. So yeah, we're talking probably five or six people for the whole operation and at a minimum. Um, is that scalable? That's, that's what we're trying to figure out. I think you need to balance that also against the cost of the treatment that you would be doing this anyway. I mean, the, the ultimate goal in my mind is to return natural fire to the landscape. You know, if we want to restore the forests, that's what we need to do. We can't do that now. We have to do this thinning work because there's too much fuel and we just destroy the forest. Um, so we have to do it anyway. So we have to do all the cutting. We have to do something. We either do slash pile burns um, that, you know, or we do chipping or masticating. It all costs a lot of money. Biochar probably is more of the most costly option, but it's an incremental cost above costs that already have to be incurred to do the restoration. Do you agree with that, Karen? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, definitely. I think about our stream restoration projects where you know we have uh, declining fisheries populations and lots of streams that need, have habitat that needs to be restored, but we're only able to afford to 
restore in a very small percentage of that area. And so it's that's where I think it really makes sense with biochar as well to just be extremely careful selecting the site where you do the work to make sure you're getting getting the biggest bang for your buck. Yeah, and if you were to go and buy biochar, you could definitely buy it cheaper, but then you have to truck it out there and you have to apply it. So, um, you know, this is not a method for making commercial biochar. Um, the commercial biochar is going to come from your biomass power plants. Um, you know, that's going to be the most economical option. So. Okay. Question from Natasha. Once spread, how does biochar affect waterborne pathogens like sudden oak death? I don't think we know. <laughs> but there's a study right there. <laughs> I, I, I haven't seen any data on that. Uh, Bill asks, uh, the kilns in the video didn't have lids. I thought the biochar production involved excluding much of the oxygen. Can you talk about this? I'll just say um, that the, the flame cap kilns, the flame is, is like the lid. Um, so the, it's correct. We, there are not lids for the ring of fire kilns. Um, we did not use uh, lids for this process or the Oregon kiln for that matter. Karen, I'll just add that we, we actually do have lids for the, the Oregon kiln. And the main thing with the, the, or the lid is really to make sure everything gets, gets put out when you're done. And I think that's where the water comes in to kind of quelch everything, take away the oxygen, uh, let the water fill those pores, and then you get, the, you get the char from there. I think we have time for two more questions and then we'll have to wrap up. Um, this is a question from Chaffee uh, to Raymond. Could you talk about the $1.2 million grant that the Sonoma Ecology Center recently received from CAL FIRE? Uh, yeah, um, yes, CAL FIRE funded a um, urban forestry project uh, that's gonna allow us to purchase a, a sort of a medium scale pyrolysis unit uh, from a company in Iowa. And uh, we're also working with a, a tree company, a medium-sized tree care company that uh, produces a massive amount of wood chips every week that they're actually landfilling now. So we're going to be diverting landfilled chips, turning it into biochar, and then uh, distributing that in the sort of uh, areas around um, the sort of distressed areas into gardens and uh, urban landscaping uh, for, for companies. So we're very excited about that. We're gonna be starting that uh, in a few months. Okay, and um, Charles has a, the last question, what size diameter tree can you burn? So uh, I'll take that one. I, I assume you mean in, in the portable kilns. Um, the target size material is one inch to four inches. That's the ideal size that you want to burn in the kiln. So, um, but in our project, we were thinning trees up to 12 inch in diameter. We were just cutting off the big part and leaving it on site and burning the tops that were the right size for the kilns. I'll just add real quickly, I think it depends on the type of uh, uh, burner you're using. Obviously these larger curtain burners can handle much larger material. So uh, as Karen commented, uh, you know, we were, uh, we were limited with the size material based on the equipment we were using. If you have larger uh, equipment, then you could burn larger material. All right, there were many more questions than we have time for today. So we'll make an effort to get back to all of you who have had questions that weren't answered in the next few days, uh, but thank you for your interest. Before we wrap up, I'd like to again thank our, all of our speakers. Uh, really awesome job, thank you. And, and also I wanna say that we wouldn't be able to do events like this without our um, back behind the scenes production staff. Uh, our production staff is Emily Ellickson Brown, Lynn Barrett and Mitzi Ryder. So thank you very much for the great job you did on this production. And, and also I wanna again thank our generous sponsors, Stanford Inn by the Sea, Wilson Biochar Associates, Sonoma Biochar Initiative, the Sonoma State University, and the California Conservation Corps, along with the event funder, uh, California Climate Investments Funding granted by the uh, California Natural Resources Agency, 
Department of Conservation through the North Coast Resource Partnership. Most of all, we want to thank all of you for joining us today and for your interest in biochar and the Redwood Forest Foundation's restore, restoration forestry. Uh, please visit us at rffi.org and make a contribution if you are so moved. Enjoy the rest of your day. We hope you uh, to see you out in the woods sometime very soon.